Section 7. Astounding Stories of Super Science, 05, May 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tommy Howell. Murder Madness by Murray Leinster. Chapter 5. The trade, which does not exist, has its obligations and its code, but also it has its redeeming features. When a man has finished his job, he has finished it. And as far as the trade was concerned, Bell had but little more to do. But after that, and his eyes burned smokily in their depths, there was much that he intended to do. He sat in one of the bondes of the botanical garden half of the street railway system of Rio, and absent-mindedly regarded the scenery. This particular bonda was headed out toward the La Roa Rodrigo de Frietas, which by salty mass of water Bell would meet Paula Canalejas. He would receive a package from her which he would deliver to Jameson, and then he would be free. And it was his private intention to engage in an enterprise which was very probably a form of suicide. But there are some things one cannot dismiss with a sage reflection that they are not one's business. This matter of Ribiera was definitely one of them. The escape from Ribiera's fazenda had been relatively easy, because so thoroughly unexpected. The little plane had climbed to 5,000 feet and found a stratum of cloud that stretched for very many miles. Bell had emerged from it only twice in the first hour of flight, and the second time the sky was clear all about him. That he was pursued, he had no doubt. That Riviera had wireless communications with Rio, he knew. And he knew that instant and imperative orders would have gone out for his capture. Rio would not be a healthy place for him. If Riviera had power over high government officials, he had surely indirect power over the police, and a search for Bell would be in order at once. Yet Canalejas assuredly expected to return to Rio. A shouted question with the motor cut out, and a nodded answer. Bell headed for Petropolis, which is Rio's only real summer resort, and is high in the hills and only an hour and a half from it by train. It was surprisingly satisfactory to be handling a swift plane again, and Bell allowed himself what he knew was about the only pleasure he was likely to have for some time to come. Something of his hatred of Ribiera, however, came back as he prepared to land. He managed to crack the plane up very neatly so that it would be of no use to Ribiera any more. And at the same time, of course, the cracking up provided an excellent excuse for Canalejas to continue on by train. They talked very briefly by the puffing engine. It is best, said Canalejas, for you, senor, to remain here overnight. I believe senor Ribiera has given orders for us both to be looked for, yet as a cabinet minister I am still immune from arrest by the ordinary police. If I reach my home I shall be able to do all that is necessary. And you will prepare a message for me to carry, said Bell. It is ready, said Canalejas. He smiled faintly. No, senor, I have instructions to give my daughter. She will deliver the information to you tomorrow. Let me see. At the edge of the Lagao, Rodrigo, de Fietas, at nine o'clock. She is the only messenger I can trust. I think that is all. Bell hesitated uncomfortably. But you, sir, he said awkwardly, you have been poisoned as Senor Ortiz was. But certainly, said Canalejas. His smile was ironic as before. But, unlike Senor Ortiz, I have no hope. I have arranged for my daughter to conceal herself and escape from Brazil. I have prepared for everything, Senor. As you know, I had intended to kill Senor Ribiera. In returning with you, I have merely delayed my own death by a few hours. Still smiling, and with the air of one entering a train for the most casual of journeys, Canalejas entered the coach. And Bell, sitting in the banda next morning, saw with an uncanny clarity the one weak point in Ribiera's hold upon his subjects. When they had the courage to fear nothing more than death, they could defy him. And not many could attain to that courage, but a few. "'I'll have some help anyway,' muttered Bell savagely to himself. 
It is the long ride to the botanical gardens, from which one half the surface lines of Rio take their name. On the way out to the Larao, Rodrigo de Fietas, which is close by the garden itself, Bell had time to work over, for the thousandth time, the information he possessed, and realized its uselessness. Two things only might be of service. One was that Ribiera was the nephew of the person referred to as the master, and yet was evidently as much subjected to him as his own victims to himself. The other was that the ultimate end of all the ghastly scheme was in some fashion political. If wealth alone had been Ribiera's aim, the gathering of his slaves would have had a different aspect. The majority of them would have been rich men, men of business, men who could pay out hundreds of thousands a month in the desperate hope of being permitted to remain sane. There would not have been politicians and officials and officers of the army. The key men of the country growled Bell inaudibly, enslaved to Ribiera. They give him the power he's after more than cash, and it's those key men who have more to lose than money. There's such a thing as honor. Three times the conductor stopped beside him and suggestively rattled the coins in his box. Three times Bell absent-mindedly paid the fare for the zone, but the ride is a long one, and he had had time to realize the hopelessness of any single-handed attack upon the thing he faced long before the end. Then he absently moved through the amazing collection of tropic and near-tropic growths that is the botanical garden until he came at once to Paula and the Lagao Rodrigo de Frietas. It was alive with birds, and they hopped and pecked and squabbled without acrimony within feet of her seated figure. Bell knew that she had been waiting for a long time. He looked quickly at her face. It was quite pale, but entirely tearless. Here is the message, Signor Bell, she said quietly but I think I have been followed. Bell growled in his throat. I did not discover it until I reached this spot, she said evenly, and I did not know what to do. If I left, I would be seized and the message taken, and I think that someone would have waited here for you. So in part to gain time, and in part because I hoped you might have some resource, I remained. How many of them? asked Bell shortly. Two, she said quietly. She looked at him, her large eyes entirely calm and grave. Give me the package, said Bell briefly. They'll be more anxious to get it back than to bother you. And I'll either knock them cold or hold them in a scrap until you get away. She reached in her pocket and handed him a small thick envelope. He stuffed it in the side pocket of his coat. I will walk away, he observed, and they'll follow me. Can you arrange to give me some sign that you're safe? By the gateway, she told him. My handkerchief. I shall start as soon as you have vanished. If I am followed, I will drop this handkerchief, as it is. If I am not followed, I will tie a knot. But what can you do? I'll do something, said Bell coldly. Something. She smiled, with the same odd bitterness her father had shown. My father shot himself, she said briefly. I have no particular hope of doing better. But I shall not be Ribiera's slave. She remained quite still. Bell moved away. He hurried. There was thick jungle ahead, a section of the gardens that is painstakingly preserved, untouched and undisturbed, that visitors to the capital of Brazil may observe a typical sample of the virgin interior. He dived into that jungle as if in flight. And very shortly after, two men dived in after him. They hesitated, these men, because your policeman of Rio does not like to injure his uniform, and there are many thorns in jungle growths. But they entered it, having first drawn small glittering weapons, and then from the jungle came silence. It seemed to be silence, but there may have been some small unusual noises. 
It would not be easy to tell if they were unusual or not, because there are peculiar flashes of charm in certain Brazilian institutions. The preservation of the spot of jungle itself is one. Another is the fact that in the gardens all manner of wild things live at large and provide unexpected and delightful surprises to the usually foreign visitors. So there were noises, after a bit, such noises as some grunting wild thing might have made, perhaps, but they might also have been the gasping of a man as breath was choked out of him. And there was a cracking sound a little later, which might, of course, have been any one of any number of accidental and perfectly natural causes. And it might have been a man upon whom another man had hurled himself when the second man landed on his jaw. And thrashing noises a little later might have been anything. But after what seemed a long time, Bell emerged. Alone. He was breathing quickly, and there were scratches on his face and hands which, well, which might have been made by thorns. He went swiftly back toward the spot where Paula had waited. He looked cautiously. She was gone. And then Bell went leisurely, in the studious fashion of a person going through the botanical gardens, because it was the thing to do, toward the gateway and the surface cars. As he neared the gate, his eyes roved with apparent casualness all about. He saw a tiny speck of white on the edge of the roadway. It looked as if it had been flung from a car. Bell picked it up. It was Paula's handkerchief, and there was no knot whatever in it. In fact, its lacy edge was torn. They've got her, said Bell, apparently unmoved. He waited for a car. A bulky figure, wearing thick spectacles, came placidly from the gardens. It waited also for the car. The car arrived in its two sections of first and second class, the first reserved for cavalieros, which is to say persons wearing coat, shirt, collar, necktie, hat, shoes and socks, and carrying no parcel larger than a briefcase. Lesser folk, who lacked any of the sartorial requirements for admission to the first-class section, or wore tomancos instead of shoes, heaped themselves into the second section and paid one-third of the fare in the first. Bell took his seat in the first section. It was comfortably filled. The bulky person with the thick spectacles wedged himself carefully into the space beside Bell. He unfolded a copy of the Journal do Comercio and began to regard the advertisements. Presently he found what he was looking for. Obicho, said medium-sized type. Beside it was a picture of a kangaroo. The gentleman with the thick spectacles resignedly fished into his pockets and found a lottery ticket. He tore it into scraps and threw them away. Then he began to gaze disinterestedly at the scenery and the other passengers in the car. Bell drummed on his knee, with one's forefinger representing a dot and one's second finger serving as a dash. It is surprising how naturally and absent-mindedly one may convey a perfectly intelligible message to a man sitting within a reasonable distance. When the man is alongside, the matter is absurdly simple. Presently the man with the thick lenses got out his paper again, as if bored by vistas such as no other city in the world can offer. His paper was in the pocket which pressed against Bell. If in getting out his newspaper he also abstracted a thick, fat envelope from Bell's pocket and placed it in his own, and if all this took place under a sign even in the section reserved for cavalieros of approved raiment, solemnly warning passengers against Botadores de Cartieres, or pickpockets, well, it was an ironical coincidence whose humor Bell did not see. He was busily tapping out on his knee the briefest possible account of what he had learned at Riviera's Fazenda up country. 
One chance for me, he tapped out at the end. If I can kidnap Ribiera, I can make him talk, somehow. He has big amphibian plane kept fueled and ready for a long trip. I think he is back in Rio to direct hunt for me. Paula kidnapped. My job finished. On my own now. The man with thick spectacles did not nod. He seemed to be looking idly at his paper, but it was folded at an article very discreetly phrased, beneath a photograph of Signor Tixiera Canalejas, Minister of War, who had very unfortunately been found dead that morning. He had been depressed of late, but there were certain circumstances which made it as yet impossible to determine whether he had killed himself or was the victim of an assassin. Getting set for me, tapped Bell grimly on his knee. Ribiera told me too much. The man with thick spectacles yawned and turned the paper over. Under a smaller headline, which would only find a place on a Brazilian sheet, a regrettable incident, an item of more direct importance was printed. It told of an unnamed senor from the United States of the North America, who, as the guest of a widely known Brazilian gentleman, had behaved most boorishly, had stolen an airplane from his host and broken it to bits on landing unskillfully, and had vanished with priceless heirlooms belonging to his host. It read virtuously. No names are mentioned because the American senor has been widely introduced in Rio society as a person with an official status in Washington. It is understood that an inquiry is to be made of the ambassador as to the status of the young man before any action is taken by the police. It is to be expected, however, that he will at least be requested to leave the country. Bell managed the barest flicker of a smile. Arrest, of course. Detention most courteously arranged while the ambassador was communicated with. And Riviera. Give me dismiss, he tapped on his knee. The gentleman in the thick spectacles ran his finger thoughtfully about the edge of his collar. In the trade, that is a signal of many varied meanings. A hand across the throat in any fashion means, clear out your job is finished. Save your skin as best you can, and get away without trying to help me. <laughs> According to circumstances, in this case it relieved Bell of all future responsibility. He yawned, tapped his lips with the back of his hand, signaled for a stop of the car, and got out. Five minutes later, he had signaled a taxicab and given Riviere's address. In six minutes, he was being whirled toward the one house in all Rio de Janeiro, from which his chance of a safe departure was slightest. In little more than half an hour, he had dismissed the cab and was gazing placidly into the startled eyes of the doorman. The doorman, like all of Rio, where Ribiera was known and feared, knew that Bell was being hunted. Bell handed over his card with an inscrutable air. The Signor Ribiera, he said dryly, returned to the city last night. Present my card and say that I would like to speak to him. The doorman ushered him inside and summoned the major domo, still blinking his amazement. And the major-domo blinked again. But Bell followed with the air of an habitué, as he was again ushered into the luxurious salon in which he had once been offered a drugged drink. Again he sank down in a softly padded chair and surveyed the pictures and the minor objects of decadent art about him. Again he lighted a cigarette with every appearance of ease, and again had the impression of eyes upon him. The major-domo appeared somewhat agitated. The Signor Ribiera, he said harshly, will see you only if you are not armed. He requires your word of honor. Bell smiled lazily. I'll do better than that, he said languidly. I haven't had time to buy a revolver, but the automatic he had put out of commission is in my pocket. Present it to him with my compliments. He handed over the weapon, but first. The majordomo blinked and took it. Bell sat down and smiled widely. He had been expected to be uproarious, to attempt to force the major-domo to lead him to Riviera, and of course he would have been led past a 
perfectly planned ambush for his capture, but he might have killed the majordomo, which would not disturb Ribiera, but had disturbed the servant. Bell smoked comfortably, and suddenly hangings parted, and Ribiera came into the room. He smiled nervously, and then, as Bell blew a puff of smoke at him, and nodded casually, he scowled. I came, said Bell deliberately, to make a bargain. Frankly, I do not like to break my word. I was under obligations to deliver a package from Señor Canalejas to a certain messenger who will take it to my government. I have done it, but I am not Señor Ribiera, a member of the Secret Service. I am entirely a free agent now, and I am prepared to consider your proposals, which I could not, in honor, do before. He smiled pleasantly. Effrontery, properly managed, is one of the most valuable of all qualities, especially in dealing with people who themselves are arrogant when they dare. Ribby purpled with rage, and then controlled it. Ah, he rumbled. You are prepared to consider my proposals? There are no proposals. The master may be amused at your cleverness in escaping. I do not know. I do know that I am ordered to make you my slave and send you to the master. That I shall do. Perhaps, said Bell blandly, but I can go without food and drink for several days, which will delay the process. And while I cannot honorably tell you how to stop the man bearing Signor Canaleas's package to my government, still, if I willingly accepted a dose of Yahque in token of my loyalty to the master... Ribiera's good humor returned. He chuckled. You actually mean, he said jovially, that you think you were given some of the master's little compound and that you wish to make terms before your hands begin to writhe at the ends of your wrists? Is not that your reason? Bell's eyes flickered. He had been horribly afraid of just that. But Ribiera's amusement was reassuring. Perhaps, said Bell. Perhaps I am. Ribiera sat down and stretched his fat legs in front of him. He surveyed Bell with an obscene, horrible amusement. Ah, senor, he chuckled. Some day we will laugh together over this. You yet hope, and do not yet know how much better it will be for you if you cease to hope and cultivate desires. The master is pleased with you. You have just those qualities he knows are necessary in dealing with your nation. He is not angry with you. It is his intention to use you to extend his, uh, influence among the officials of your nation. You know, of course, that in but a little more time I will hold all Brazil, as I now hold this city, in the hollow of my hand. Four of the republics of this continent are already completely under the control of the master's deputies, and of the rest, Brazil is not the most nearly subdued. A year or two and the master will become emperor, and his deputies viceroys. And it is his whim to give you the opportunity of becoming the first deputy and the first viceroy of North America. And you come to me and offer, you, senor, to make terms. I believe even the master will laugh when he hears of it. But said Bell practically. Do you accept my terms? Ribiera chuckled again. What are they, senor? That you release the daughter of the senor Canalejas, and pledge your word of honor that she will not be enslaved? Ribiera's word of honor, of course, would be worth rather less than the breath that was used to give it, but his reception of the proposal would be informative. He chuckled again. No, senor, I do not accept. But I will promise you, as a favor, because my uncle, the master, admires you, that within a few weeks you shall enjoy her charms. I do not. He added with amused candor, find that any one woman diverts me for a very long time. Oh, said Bell very quietly. He sat still for an instant, and then shrugged, and looked about as if for an ashtray in which to knock the ashes from his cigarette. He stood up, carrying the tube of tobacco gingerly, and moved toward one by Ribiera's elbow. He knocked off the ash and crushed out the tiny coal, 
He fumbled in his pockets. The next instant, Ribiera choked with terror. Let me explain, said Bell softly. I did not give your major domo my word that I was unarmed. I merely gave him a weapon. I got these from two policemen who tried to arrest me an hour or so ago. And I also remind you, senor, that if the armed men you have posted to prevent my escape try to shoot me, that the inevitable contraction of my muscles will send two bullets into your heart, even if I am dead. I am a dead man, senor, if you give the word. But so are you, if you give it. Ribiera gasped. His eyes rolled in his head. Send for her, said Bell very gently. Send for her, senor. I estimate that she has been in this house for less than half an hour. Have her brought here at once, and if she has been harmed, the three of us will perish very promptly, and half of Rio will go mad after our death. And the muzzles of two revolvers bored into the fat flesh of Ribiera's body, and a gasp that was almost a wail of terror came from the watchers, armed watchers, who dared not kill the man they had been posted to guard Ribiera against. Ribiera lifted his hand and croaked an order. To be continued. End of chapter 5 of Murder Madness by Murray Leinster.